Matt, if you can put the phones on a, on a vibrate or turn them off, you'll benefit more from the class. So my name is Rabbi Alona Nava, and tonight I'm going to share with you one of the most important information that you need to know. Why are we here? Why did we come to this world? And why we live here so many years? And most important, what we're supposed to do here. And the thing is that I read once an article that uh, there's a movie, I don't watch movies, but in the article it, it was talking about a movie, uh, uh, Elisabeth Zaplot, uh, what's her name? Uh, what's, how do you say it in English? Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, okay? So it's talking about this movie that there was a girl in Wonderland and she was walking down a path and she had a little rabbit and she comes to a crossroad and she doesn't know if you turn right or if you turn left. She doesn't know what to do. So she asks her friend, what should we do? Should we turn right? Should we turn left? So then came another character from the movie and he told her, what's going on? What's the... Uh, What's your problem? She says, I don't know if to turn right or if to turn left. So he, tell her, he tells her, where are you heading? She tells him, I'm just walking, just going for a walk. So, tell her, so he told her, so what's the difference if you turn right or left? There's no difference. So the thing is, that this is the same thing with this world. If we have a plan, if we know where we're heading, then it makes a difference if we turn left or if we turn right. But if we don't know where we're heading, if we don't know where is our last stop, so what's the difference if I turn right, if I turn left? If I don't know my destination, my spiritual destination, so what's the difference if I eat kosher, if I don't eat kosher, if I keep Shabbat, I don't keep Shabbat? What's the difference? Because I don't know where I'm going. But if I know where I'm going, then every little thing that I do makes a difference. So the point is that many people come to this world and they don't know where they're heading. If I would know where I came from and where I'm heading, then I would be able to plan my route and to understand what I need to achieve. And most people, either they're born to be religious and they taught them, you got to keep Shabbat, you have to eat kosher, you have to pray. So they're like a robot. They don't understand. And some people, they just discovered it. And they need to know, where am I heading? So the same way that I'm going to walk now into a car, going, going to a car, and I want to get to a destination, then I punch in my GPS the address, and the GPS tells me, take this highway, take this route. If you take this highway, you're going to run into traffic. If you take this highway, it's going to take you such and such time. If you take that route, there's going to be less traffic. And I choose my route, but the destination is the same destination. But at least I have a destination. I know where I'm going. And if I don't have a destination, there's no point of getting into the car and going anywhere. So tonight I want to give in, in a very general, but in more in a depth way, where we came from, why are we here, what are we going through, where are we heading, and why should I even bother here? I'm here for 60, 70, 80 years, but what, what do I need it for? So it all started that before the world was created, there was just Hashem, just God. Him and His name, Hu Shmo. And all the souls were around God, and they were enjoying what's called Ziv HaShchina, the rays of the glory of Hashem. Not, they weren't even seeing Hashem. They were just enjoying the rays of the godly light. Same way that if the sun is shining outside, and let's say now it's daylight and I look through the window, I see daylight, but I don't really see the sun. I see just the rays, not even the rays, just the shine of the rays of the sun, because I'm in a room and I just see a little bit out. So then the out, all the souls were standing around Hashem, and they were enjoying this glory of Hashem, 
the Holy Zohar calls it the Noga. Noga is this, is this, uh, the edge of the, of the, of the, the light. And at some point they felt very ashamed, very embarrassed. They told Hashem, you know, you, you're just giving us and giving us and giving us. And we, we feel embarrassed. Because we're, we're like, a, like a beggar that just comes and takes food. The Zohar calls it Nehama de Ksufa, bread of shame. Like a person who's poor and he comes every day to a certain place to ask for food. So the souls felt very embarrassed and they told Hashem, we want to do something for you. Because we feel like we're not doing nothing. So Hashem said, no problem. I'm going to create a world and I'm going to put your souls in bodies and you're going to work in this world and you're going to earn your reward. And when you're going to earn your reward, you're going to come back here. And what I give you, this godly revelation that I share with you, you're going to earn it. You're not going to just get it. And that's how the story started way before the world was created. Now, in general, we know of five types of worlds. And of course, I'm talking about spiritual worlds. Hasidut and Kabbalah are talking about four spiritual worlds, which is the world of Atzilut, the world of Bria, Yetzira ve'asiya. but I'm not talking about these worlds. There's five types of worlds that we know about. The first world is Holamaze, this world, this world where we live in. Then there's Holamaba. Now, not Holam Abba, the famous Holam Abba that everybody's talking about it. Rather, the Holam Habbabato, the next one in line, which is called Olam Neshamot. And this world is divided in three types. Gan Eden, Genom, and Kafakela. These are the three parts of this spiritual world. Then we have Yemot HaMashiach, the days of the Mashiach. Then we have Tchiat Amitim, the time of resurrection of the dead. And then we have Olam Abba. These are the five types of worlds that we go through. Because I just said before that we started somewhere around the Shem in some spiritual place and that's where we started. Now we have to go through all these worlds in order to get to the last one, to the final one, which is called Olam Abba. Now some people confuse it because Many people say Olam Abba is the next world, the world to come, the famous world to come where everything is going to be very special. But some Mefarshim say Olam Abba is the next world that I have to go through. Now I'm here. Now I go to the Olam Abba to the next world. And then from there I'm going to go to the next world. So when I'm going to refer to Olam Abba, I'm talking about the last Olam Abba, which is our destination. Now when I know the destination, and I know where I started, now I need to know the route, the derech, what I have to do, where I come from, how I come from. So, you know, there's a pasuk that says in the Torah that we must know where we came from. Exactly. This is a Mishnah. The Ritzah is exactly like she said, da me'ayin bata, know where you came from, ve'le'an ata olech, and where are you going? Who are you going to stand in front of and give judgment? So each person has to know that. So it all begins that the soul comes down to this world. And in the beginning, Hashem created the world. We know the famous story. There was Adam and Chava, the first man, the first woman. And then it was supposed to be a perfect world. In the beginning, the world was supposed to be created for seven days. It wasn't supposed to be for so many, time, for many years. It was supposed to be for seven days. It was supposed to be the six days of creation, then the creation of Adam and Chava, then Adam and Chava were supposed to keep one Shabbat. That's all they needed to do. Adam Arishon wrote the Mizmor Shir Le'om HaShabbat, the, 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 the chapter of Tehillim that we read on Erev Shabbat. And all they had to do is Kabbalat Shabbat, Adam Rishon only had to say, boy kala, boy kala, accept the Shabbat, keep one Shabbat, and that's it, and the story is over. But the story got messed up right from the beginning. So we know the famous story that Adam and Chava, they ate from the tree of knowledge, they sinned, and they brought down the sin to the world. 
And from here, we started our entire journey. From the sin that they did in Gan Eden the first time, this brought death to the world, and it brought the root of all the rest of the sins that are going to happen, and we came down here to fix it. So when our soul comes down here, it comes down here many times. Darizal wrote in a book, Sefer Agilgulim, the, the, the book of reincarnations, in a very in-depth way, that each one of us has to come down to this world at least three times, at least, minimum three times, to do all 613 mitzvot b'machshava, dibur v'maaseh. Thought, speech, and action. Which means all of us are already gilgulim. We are reincarnated. We are here for a few times already. Now we don't know where we came from. We don't know what we did. We don't know what we're missing. Many people think that if I came down to this world, means that in the previous world, I wasn't good, and now I'm punished, and I had to come back here again and to fix something that I did in a previous life. So there's a little percentage of the truth in it. But the reality is that I have to come down to this world to complete all 613 mitzvot in three levels, with my thought, with my speech, and with my actions. Now, could very much be that I was here a couple hundred years ago, and I did a lot of mitzvot, and I came down now to this world to complete five more mitzvot with my thought, ten more mitzvot with my speech, and twelve mitzvot with my action. Could be that that's the only thing that I'm missing. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm exempt from all the rest. I still have to do all the rest. But my neshama has to go through a whole cycle. Of course, we know from the exact topic of the reincarnation that sometimes the soul does have to come down here and to fix something it did in the past. Because our soul is not one entity like we think. The soul is built from many different pieces. In general, we know of five levels of our soul. The highest level of the soul is called Yechida. The next level of our soul is called Chaya. These two levels of our souls are so holy and for, so far removed from us that we have no connection to this part of the soul. In Olam Abba, we're going to have a connection to it. Only tzaddikim, they have a connection. They reach the level, the madrega of chaya or the madrega of yechida. But only tzaddikim Murim can reach to that level in this world. We don't have this opportunity. We mainly operate in the three lower levels of the soul that in Lashon Kodesh are called neshama, ruach, and nefesh. The neshama is the peace from Hashem, a holy peace from Hashem that is in our body, and a very small piece of the neshama, a small percentage is in the body, not the entire neshama. Most of the soul is in shamayim. Bechlal, we know that the soul is built, the, the, the darga, the level of neshama, is built from 30 pieces. And we know that 30 days before a person passes away from this world, Every day, one piece leaves the body. The Midrash says that 40 days before a person passes away, the Tselem Eloki, the godly figure in the body, leaves the body. That's why we sometimes see people that are old and before they die, they start giving things away, they start saying goodbye, they start talking all sorts of weird things, because their Neshama already is no, it knows it's time. 40 days before a person passes away, it's announced in the heavens, that this person is about to leave the world, all the, the family starts gathering around to prepare for the arrival of that neshama. But while the neshama is in the body, a very small piece of the neshama is in the body. Most of the neshama, most of the soul is in the world above. We mainly act in this world with the level of ruach and the level of nefesh, mainly in the level of nefesh. And the nefesh is the lowest level in the spirituality in our body. We know we have nefesh elokit and nefesh bemit. Nefesh elokit is a godly soul that all it wants to do is run after godly things. It wants to do mitzvot. It wants to learn Torah. It wants to do good. It doesn't want to sin. But it, it has a roommate. It has a partner. And that is called the nefesh bemit, the animal soul. Not because it's an animal, 
rather because its character and its traits are like an animal. It wants to enjoy food, it wants to sleep, it wants to enjoy this world. It has no connection to anything spiritual. So you see sometimes in your mind that you wake up in the morning and you say in your mind, okay, let's go and pray Shacharit now with a minyan. Suddenly the Nefesh Abimit says, no, 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 let's sleep in another hour, it's okay. Or you walk through the day and you're like, oh, look what a beautiful restaurant, the food smells so good. The Nefesh Abimit tells you, let's go and eat there. And your Nefesh Abimit, no, 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 it's not kosher, I can't go in there. You constantly have this battle in your mind that is the Nefesh Abimit is pulling towards Kedusha, towards holiness, and the Nefesh Abimit is pulling towards the other side of holiness. But mainly we function in this world corresponding to the Nefesh. Now the Nefesh and the Ruach and the Neshama, in order to correspond in this world, it gets dressed in spiritual garments. These garments are on the same three madrigot, thought, speech and actions, and the soul gets dressed in the Ruach, and the soul in the Ruach gets dressed into the Nefesh, like cups that you put them one on top of the other, like plastic cups, you pile them up, you get like a tower of cups, so they all get dressed one inside the other. The soul is the manager, gives the, the orders what to do. But the nefesh, that's the level that actually moves the body and interacts with the body. And imagine you see like this big uh, crane. And you see this huge crane lifting up tons, tons of cement and huge things. And inside there's like a little box and a, a man is sitting in the box. And he's moving all sorts of sticks, and he's controlling this massive crane. That's how the soul is. The nefesh goes into the body, and it has to move this huge body. I want to move my hands. For me, it's a natural thing just to move my hand. But it's my nefesh, my spirit in the body that moves everything. Now, the thing is that the main thing that we came down to do in this world is to do mitzvot. For one reason, is that each mitzvah that I do, I sew a spiritual garment to my soul. So I have three types of mitzvot. We said before that Arizal said that we have to come down to this world to do all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. So all the mitzvot that I do with my thought, meaning thinking of Hashem, the, how great Hashem is, concentrating on Hashem when I meditate, when I say Shema Israel, thinking how I want to help another person. There's many mitzvot that I can do just with my head. Even reading Torah, learning Torah, and understanding when I learn, what I read, this is doing the mitzvah b'machshava with my thoughts. Of course, I can do many more things with my thoughts. But when I do a mitzvah with my thoughts, I'm sewing a spiritual garment to my neshama in Gan Edel and Leon. Before we talked about the first world, Olam Azeh, then we talked about the second world, that we said it gets split in three, Gan Eden, Geenom, and Kafa Kela. So Gan Eden is broken into two madrigot, to two levels, Gan Eden Tachton, a lower level in Gan Eden, and a higher level of Gan Eden, Gan Eden and Leon. And in those levels, there's ends of inf infinite amount of levels. But when I do mitzvot with my thoughts, I'm creating this spiritual garment to my neshama in Gan Eden Elyon. When I do mitzvot with my mouth, bedibur, which can be saying brachot, praying, learning Torah, etc., then I'm sewing a spiritual garment to my ruach in Gan Eden Tachton. And when I do mitzvot with bemase, with actions, I put fill in, I light candles, I shake a lulav, anything that I do with an act, then I'm sewing a spiritual garment to my nefesh that stays next to the grave. During the life, when I live in this world, my main focus is those mitzvot. Yes, I have to learn Torah, because the Torah that I learn, and if you're a woman, women can also learn Torah, and if they don't have time, they have to tell their husband to go learn Torah because it's a partnership. But the Torah is the mazon. It's the food for the soul. When the soul goes up to Shemaim, it needs food. 
The food is Torah. If a person doesn't study Torah, he goes up to Shemaim, there's no food. The mitzvot are those garments. So the soul needs both the Torah and the mitzvot. You cannot just learn Torah, you cannot just do mitzvot, and for sure you cannot miss both. But you need both. You need the Torah to have food, the neshama. The soul needs food in Gan Eden, spiritual food, of course. We know the Torah is the wisdom of Hashem, and the mitzvot are the garments. The same way that now, I'm not going to walk in the street naked, I put on clothes. Why? If it's 90 degrees outside, I'm not cold, why should I put clothes on? Because I cover myself. Because it's embarrassing and it's not appropriate to walk in the street naked. I don't know anyone who just walks in the street naked. Now more than that, the garments kind of shape us. If you go with dirty clothes and you go with uh, you know, all your clothes are dirty and torn, the impression you make that you're, you know, you don't go to do a good impression. But you can walk with a thousand dollar suit. Nobody knows who you are. You can be the poorest person in the world. But you have a beautiful suit. Oh, wow, look, everybody treats you already different. So we know the levush, the garment, can kind of make us. So the same thing, the soul, it needs levushim. It needs these garments. Now, it, the soul needs those garments for two reasons. First of all, it needs it because the soul needs to be dressed with something when it goes up to the spiritual world. Same way that I don't want to be naked here, but the soul doesn't want to be naked up in Shemaim. But mainly these garments that I sew allow me to get this godly revelation in Gan Eden. Now, a soul comes now to Gan Eden, all the souls that are, that are allowed to, or they, they earn it, they go to Gan Eden. And each soul goes to Gan Eden according to its work down in this world. So one person all his life was devoted to Torah and Mitzvot. All he did was study Torah and learn and teach and give charity and help. And all day long he was devoted to serving Hashem. His Gan Eden is a very high Gan Eden. Because every second of his life he devoted to serving Hashem. Another person can be also in Gan Eden but at a much, lo much lower level in Gan Eden. Whatever we did in this world is how much we acquire these garments from the Maineshama in Gan Eden. So this world is basically the place where I sew my suit. Now imagine you go now to the biggest, I don't know, cocktail party in history. You go to a big party where the president is there and senators are there and businessmen. You want to come with your nicest suit. And now the thing is, how would you look if you come with a gorgeous suit, but it's missing here a button, and here it's missing a pocket, and here I'm missing a sleeve, and here I'm missing a patch. I'm going to look like a clown. I want to come with a, my suit perfect. So when the neshama, when the soul goes up to shamaim, they're accepting, they're telling the soul, come, come into Gan Eden. If the soul doesn't have these garments that cover the soul, the soul is embarrassed because he's like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not, I don't look appropriate. So a lot of people say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see the benefit of all the mitzvot. Give me this, 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 and this, and I don't want to do all the rest. The thing is that each mitzvah that we have corresponds to a piece of our soul. So we have 248 positive mitzvot. Positive, not because it's positive to do, rather because it's a positive commandment. So each one of these 248 positive mitzvot correspond to 248 pieces of our nefesh. Which means that every positive mitzvah that I do, I sew a piece, it's a patch, that covers one piece of that nefesh. More than that, these mitzvot are like spiritual nutrition to the soul. So the same way that a person will not only eat apples. If a person hypothetically will only drink water and eat apples, he's not going to die. He will live. But he's not going to live so healthy and he's going to suffer from not having the right nutrition and maybe Chas Shalom will have a lot of diseases. Why? Because he's not getting all the nutrition. He's only eating one thing. That's why we have to eat vegetables and fruit and carbs, and meat, and, and, and fish, we have to eat everything. So the same thing, the soul needs 
all the mitzvot. It cannot sustain on two mitzvot, or three mitzvot, or ten mitzvot. Because a lot of people say, okay, I'll do this, this, and this, all the rest, I don't want to do it. So it's not chas v'shalom, a lot of people come and tell me, oh, if I don't do this and this and mitzvah, am I going to go to Genom? No, it has nothing to do with it. But you're lacking peace, uh, nutrition, this spiritual nutrition to your soul. You're preventing from your soul to get its nutrition. More than that, you are not creating this piece of this spiritual garment that completes this perfect garment. So the soul comes up to Gan Eden, but it's missing a sleeve. And it's missing a pocket in the back, and it has a hole here. So the soul gets embarrassed. It doesn't want to be part of it. So all these mitzvot that we got are for us, A, to give nutrition, spiritual nutrition to my soul. That's why we see in our, in, in our generation, we see so many problems. Health problems. Almost any second person you meet has health problems. Okay, people can, can, can blame it on pollution or bad nutrition or uh, cellular phones. There's all, you can blame it on everything. But the reality is that the sickness manifests from a spiritual sickness. If my soul is not 100% getting what it needs, it will manifest down to the body and the body will get a sickness. So according to nature, it will get some type of a sickness. But we see in our generation, half the people in the world have sicknesses, the other half has mental sicknesses, all sorts of depression, and anxieties, and fears, and all sorts of things, and people blame it again on all sorts of other things. All these things originate from a spiritual deficiency. So if you look at a person and he has some type of a problem, you can kind of analyze the problem and realize what is missing in the spiritual level. Maybe something is missing. And I always give an example that many years ago, my mom became more observant. And she was complaining to me that she has pains in her wrists. And she went to all the orthopedics, in the, everybody. Nobody solved the problem. They did the x-rays, they did everything. No, they couldn't figure out why she has pains in her wrists. So she came to me. Maybe I have some hocus pocus. <laughs> so I told her, you know what, let's try. I told her, do, when you wake up in the morning, do you wash your hands? She was like, yeah, of course I wash my hands. You told me many years ago to wash my hands. I told her, when you wash your hands? Right when you wake up? No, I take a shower, then I eat, then I this, then I that. At 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I wash my hands. I told her, okay, so now you wash your hands first thing in the morning. And why did I say that? Because the washing of the hands, the halakha says that you have to wash till the wrist. If you didn't wash till the wrist, you didn't do it right. The next thing that I told her, do you give charity? Oh, of course I give charity. What kind of a question is it? Once a month, I write a check to my favorite organization. So I told her, so now every day, except Shabbat, take even a quarter and just put it in the kupatz daka, in the box, just to have the act. It's not the quarter, it's not the quality of the donation, it's the quantity. And sure enough, my hocus pocus worked. A month passed, no more pains in the wrists, in both hands, everything was solved. So, almost in anything you can pinpoint on somebody that is lacking something, if you look at it, you can kind of figure out what's the spiritual deficiency. So when Hashem gave us all the mitzvot, it's not to make our life hard, or not to make our life restricted. It's our nutrition, our nutrition that we have to give our soul. And if I'm not giving my soul it, then my soul will complain. So either I'll get sick, chas v'shalom, or I'll have all sorts of mental issues, depression, and uh, fears, and anxiety, and all sorts of things like that, because my soul is not happy. Not because of my mind, not because of my body, not because of anything else, because of my soul. So all these mitzvot are to feed our nefesh, so it will have its spiritual nutrition. But more than that, each mitzvah sows a garment to my nefesh when it goes to Gan Eden. So when you realize, wait a minute, I'm one day going to come to Gan Eden and I want to look my best. So I have to have all these mitzvot to sew all these garments. More than that, we said before that the mitzvot be with action 
they sew the garment for the nefesh that sits on the grave. The mitzvot in speech is for the nef- in ruach in Gan Eden Tachton, and the mitzvot in machshava is for the neshama in Gan Eden Lelion. So when I come down to this world, we started in the beginning by, said, by saying that the souls felt uncomfortable. They told Hashem we want to do something. So technically Hashem created the world, put us here, and He told us, okay, now you're going to earn your reward. You're going to earn your sachar. So you do a lot, your reward is going to be big. You do less, your reward is going to be less. And each one gets a different reward. Because for one person, it's the easiest thing to put fill in on. And another person, it's the hardest thing to put fill in on. So for the one that it's easy to put that fill in, it's not the same reward for the one that it's hard for him. Lefum tsara agra. The more, the Gemara says, the more the, the more the sorrow in, the more the reward. So each person has certain mitzvot that are more particular to him. And a lot of people tell me, how do I know what are the mitzvot that I have to more concentrate on? So the easiest thing is just to look at the mitzvot that are the hardest for me to do. Because if something is easy for me to do, then, you know, it's not a big deal. I'll do it bekef, gladly. But if something is real hard for me, it means it's here I have an opposition, means that here I have to put most of my weight. So these mitzvot that we got are for us to enjoy this spiritual benefit in this world and in the world to come. It serves for me as garments. Now, we know that when the soul goes through its life here, its soul has a certain amount of time that it came to the world to do its work, its avodah in this world, and at some point we all leave. Nobody stays here. What happens is when we finally leave, there's many different ways how the soul leaves the body. And a lot of people, when they realize the options, then they understand more what's the value of what they do in this world. So there's three types of ways that the soul leaves the body and each one is defined in a different title. And it's not the titles that we use to them. But the first title is a tzaddik, the second title is a benoni, but not the benoni that the Sefer, the book of Tanya is talking about. That's a very high level. I'm talking about the a level of benoni that is half Sins, half, mitzvot, half, half. And then the third one is the level of what's called rasha, a wicked person. Not because he's wicked, because he's mean to other people, rather because his definition in the base din shel mala, in the heavenly court, is that he's missing a lot of mitzvot, and he's doing a lot of sins, and he's called in the spiritual definition rasha, a wicked person. So a person who's a tzaddik, the way he leaves this world, the shechina, comes and takes the soul out of the body. Very, very soft. And it's explained that comes the Shekhinah itself and it takes the soul out of the body of a tzaddik so gently that the death is just pure. It's clean. There's no issues. The soul goes right to Shemaim. But most people are not in that level. Most of us are in the level of the Benoni. And again, not the Benoni that the Sefer Tanya is talking about, because that level is a very high level. There's very few people in the world that can be in the level of Benoni. I'm talking Benoni means half mitzvot, half averot, like most of the people. Half sins, half good deeds. What happens here is that the way the soul would leave the body is by a malach shel rachamim, an angel of mercy. And the way he takes out the neshama is like slaughtering an animal the kosher way. If you ever saw how they slaughter an animal the kosher way, the knife is so perfect that if it has one little microscopic ble- b- blemish, it will make the, the shechita, the slaughtering, not kosher, and the meat is not kosher. Because this microscopic blemish on the knife will cause pain to the animal. That's the reason why if you look once how a shochet, how he does it, Every time before he does the shechita, he checks the knives, he makes sure that there's not even a microscopic blemish on the knife. Because if there is, it's going to make the food taref, unkosher. More than that, it's going to cause pain to the animal. And we have a commandment 
in the Torah. We're not allowed to, to cause pain to animals. Tzar ba'al echaim. So the shechita kshera, the kosher slaughtering that we do to the animals, that's how this malach hachamim, this angel of mercy, comes to kivyachol in a spiritual way, shechts the body, meaning that he does this, this uh, uh, operation, and he takes the soul very gently out of the body. And the soul doesn't feel pain from that. But the worst option is if chas v'shalom, a person is a rasha, then malach hamavet comes, the angel of death, the famous angel of death, and he does the shechita, the slaughtering, with sakin puguma, with a knife that is blemished. So first of all, the shechita, the, the cutting, is painful for the soul. It feels the pain. And worse than that, exactly how it sounds, the angel of death, the scary one that we know of, comes and rips the neshama out of the body. Now here there's many different sources in the Gemara, in the Zohar, in many books of Kabbalah that explains kind of the order what happens. So I'm just going to go a little bit through it because it's important to know. So we know that 40 days before the person dies, the Tzelem Ha'eloki leaves the body. The godly figure that, that we have leaves the body. We've seen many people right before they die, like I said before, they start talking all sorts of weird things, they give things away, they apologize to people, they seal businesses, they close deals, they don't, they don't want to leave anything open. 30 days before the leaving of the Neshama, Every day a piece of the neshama leaves the body. On the day of the death, the ruach and the nefesh would leave the body too. Now the way it's described in the Gemara, how it looks, the, the parable that it gives, like a person, a jockey, riding on a horse, suddenly the horse stops and the jockey flies off the horse. So he rolls on the floor, he gets up, he turns around to get back on the horse, but he sees himself on the horse. And that's how the Gemara describes how the soul gets thrown out of the body. It just gets thrown out of the body. It looks back. It wants to go back. And it suddenly sees, it sees itself. Some of you were lucky enough to hear my lecture how I had my near-death experience. And that's how I saw it. How I saw my body. I was looking at my own body. So the soul leaves the body. And the first week what happens, first of all, before the first week, the first thing that happens, the last person that leaves the cemetery just walks out. They finish the levaya, they finish the funeral. The last person that stepped out of the, the, the cemetery, four angels go down to the grave, they jump into the grave, and each one grabs the body, one from this hand, one from this hand, one from one foot, and one from the other foot, and they throw the nefesh out of the body. Now the Gemara describes it in a very scary way, because it says that each one of these angels, they come with torches of fire, and they start beating the soul. This is called Chibut HaKever. Chibut HaKever, in, in a short version of Chibut HaKever, Chibut HaKever means the Chibut is when you punch something, when you hit something. Kever is a grave. The problem is that when we go in, we, when we come to this world, we get involved in a lot of mundane things in this world. Even things that we're allowed to do. We're allowed to eat, we're allowed to enjoy ourselves, we're allowed to sleep, we're allowed to do a lot of things. But for example, only on Shabbat you're allowed, and it's a mitzvah, to enjoy food. During your week, there's not a mitzvah to enjoy food, and you're not really allowed to enjoy food. So you're, you're supposed to eat just to have a little bit of energy. But not to all day long dine and wine and wines and steaks all day long. On Shabbat it's a mitzvah. Now what happens is that we live in this world. So A, we do all sorts of bad things. We do some sins. We're not perfect. More than that, we do a lot of things that even though we were permitted, but we do a lot of them. What happens is that all these things create this dirt on our soul. And in the olden days, I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother, the way she used to clean the, the rugs, she used to throw them on the railing, and she had the stick, and she used to hit the rug, and all the dust went flying out of the rug. They didn't have a vacuum cleaner. So the same thing, that's what they need to do to the soul. Because when the soul comes down into the body, it gets dressed into the body, and the soul is pure, it's holy. Like we say in Birkot HaShachar, Neshama Shinatatabi, Teorai, 
It's pure. But then it gets dressed in this dirty body. And then the body does all sorts of dirty things. Does sins, thinks the wrong things, says the wrong things, eats the wrong things. So the soul gets this dirt on it. So the first thing they need to do is to get the dirt out. And this is this chibut kevel. The thing is that there's many ways in this world to minimize this chibut kevel, to minimize the, the, the process. Bechlal in the Gemara, it's talking about that right when these angels go and they start hitting the soul with these torches of fire, the first thing that it asks, they ask the soul is, what's your name? That's why our sages taught us that when we finish saying Tefillat Shemona every time, at the end, at the end, we say a verse that has the first letter of my name and the last letter of the name. And we say it after the Yiratzon, the second one. So when I finish Shemona I have to say a Pasuk, that if my name is alone, I have to say a Pasuk that starts with an Aleph and ends with a Nun. And if I have two names, then I have to say two psukim. It's even customary that you say also a pasuk of a tzaddik that you are relating to or you connected to. Why? Because when these angels come and they start smacking the soul, the first thing they ask you, who are you? What's your name? So the soul says, this is my name. The second the soul says their name, they leave him alone. Then what happens is, the soul goes to Marat HaMachpelah. In, in Israel, all the souls go through Marat HaMachpelah. But who does it meet the first time? It meets Adam HaRishon. And it comes and complains to Adam HaRishon. And he says, because of you, I died. Because you brought de death to the world, now I died. So that's what the Zohar says. And the Zohar says, oh, you want to compare sins? Okay, you're right, I did one sin. And I brought death to the world. Let's see how many sins you did. And then the soul has to start going up. And Adam Arishon starts counting those sins. The Ramak, Rabbi Moshe Kordevora, wrote that when we create, when we do a mitzvah in this world, I create some type of a pipe. The word that he's using is tsinor. Tsinor is like a pipe, but you can call it a tunnel or a pipe or a hose or anything that is like in the shape of a pipe. But the Ramak says that every mitzvah that I do, I create this tunnel, this pipe, that my neshama will go through up to the upper world. And if I do a sin, then I start choking this pipe. So if I do many mitzvot, then this tunnel that I'm creating, this pipe, this tzinor, is pure. And that's where my neshama, where the soul goes up from. And according to what I did in this world, that's how the takeoff will be. The problem is that with the mitzvot that I do here, I also do here the opposite of mitzvot. So I start clogging this pipe. And the same way in the physical world, if you take uh, a sink and you start pouring some mud in there or stones, it will clog the sink and then that's it. It's clogged. You have to call the plumber to come and take it out. So the same thing in the spiritual level. I can do a lot of mitzvot and I build this tzinor, this pipe that one day my neshama will go through but then I come and do one sin and another sin and another sin. I start choking it. So then the neshama has this kind of a pain going up. Then what happens is that the first seven days the nefesh stays next to the grave. In the morning the nefesh goes home. In the night, the nefesh goes back to the grave. This is one of the reasons why we sit Shiva. If you really think of it, why do we mourn? If you look at the Torah, when it was talking about mourning, then we see many different days. When Aaron HaKohen died, they mourned for 40 days. Why do we do only 7 days? So the Zohar explains that the first 7 days after the death, the nefesh is next to the grave. It still misses this world. The nefesh is very connected to this world. It misses its family, it misses its food, its surroundings. That's the main reason why our sages teach us don't enjoy too much this world. Because when it's time to leave, you're going to start, the nefesh misses it. It doesn't want to leave. It goes to the grave because it has to leave. Then it goes home. No, I don't want to leave. I want to be part of here. That's why we cover the mirrors 
in the Shiva, because the soul, the nefesh, it sees itself. And if it would see itself in the mirror, the nefesh gets very frightened. We cover the mirrors. But in the first week, the nefesh goes back and forth, back and forth. At night, it's in the, in the kever, in the grave. In the morning, during the day, it's in the Shiva. And the nefesh sees everything. It hears everything. It hears all the thoughts. It knows exactly what's going on. And it's going backwards and forth. That's why we're not allowed to go to the, to the grave in the seven days, because it disturbs the soul. Then the next 30 days, the, the nefesh is still next to the body. The nefesh doesn't want to leave. The entire first year, the ruach goes up, the neshama goes up, the nefesh stays next to the grave. The only time that the nefesh finally leaves is when the body gets completely decomposed. Then it's finally the nefesh is leaving this world. But what it leaves in this world, it leaves an impression. And the same way that if you, you take your hand into like mud or something, here somebody took me to the street where there's stars on the floor, and people put their hands on the floor, all the, all the Hollywood actors, and they put their hand on the floor, and everybody comes to see the great, uh, <laughs> great Avodah. So the same way that you put an impression, you'll put your hand into mud or into cement, you leave an impression, the nefesh gets dressed into the body for 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. It gets the shape of the body. So the nefesh has the look of the body. That's why when we dream on a relative that passed away, that's how you see the shape. That's how you connect. Because the nefesh is the level that will come to a person in his dream. And the nefesh has the look of the body. The Zohar calls it the reshimu, the impression. So the nefesh leaves an impression in this world, and it leaves this impression next to the grave. That's why we know, Lehavdil, when a tzaddik passes away, the, the kever, the grave of a tzaddik, that's why we go to pray at the, at the grave of a tzaddik, because the impression is of the nefesh of the tzaddik. That's why we go to the, to the uh, holy graves of tzaddikim. But the nefesh stays around the grave, and in order for it not to be bothered, it needs all these levushim. Because in the graveyard, there's all these mazikim and all these chitzonim and shedim and ruchot and all these scary things. And in order for the nefesh not to be affected, it needs all the mitzvot b'maseh, these actions that I said that they sew the garment for the nefesh in next to the grave. Then we know the first year, the soul has to go through a mishpat, through a trial. A trial of a rasha, of a wicked person, is 12 months. A trial of a tzaddik, which is the other side. Tzaddik comes from the word tzodek, because he won the, the trial. It's only 11 months, that's why we say Kaddish 11 months. But the, 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 the first 12 months is when the neshama goes through its trial. And it needs people down here to say Kaddish and to read Tehillim and to learn Torah and to give charity and to do many, many things because it just, A, helps the Neshama to go a little bit higher, it gives us a lot of schuyot, a lot of merits, and many more things. And then finally the Nefesh, the Neshama, gets decided where it goes. And we said before, I don't want to go too much into it because it's not so important, but we have three options, Kafa Kela, Genom, and Gan Eden. We're concentrating only on Gan Eden because that's where we want to go to. But this is the first three Places where the neshama, where the neshama can end. Kafa Kela, the Gemara explains it, that it's like a slingshot. That they take the soul, there's one angel standing on one side of the universe, another angel standing on the other side of the universe, and they throw the soul from one side of the universe and they throw it around. And apparently, according to what the Gemara describes, it's a, it's a very terrible punishment for the soul. And then Kamuvan, we have Gehenom. Gehenom, people think hell, that it's a bad place. It's actually a good place because it's a washing machine. If I now, chas v'shalom, made some bad things, and I wasn't able to do tshuva in this world, and I went up, was my time to go up there, so I have dirt on my soul, then they say, go to the washing machine, we'll wash you off a little bit, so you can go back and go into Gan Eden, and sit and wait there. And the thing is that, it's very important to know that when chas v'shalom, a person does the opposite of the will of Hashem, a sin, there's a chain reaction, what happens. And it's important to know because that's what's, what's, 
what's going to help us prevent from doing that and also fix it. But when Chas Shalom a person does the opposite will of Hashem, he does a sin. So there's a chain reaction what happens. The first thing that happens, he didn't listen to Hashem. Aval Ritzon Hashem. He didn't listen to the commandment of the master of the universe. Which when you think of it, it's chutzpah. How dare you? The master of the universe told you to do something and you're not listening to him? How dare you? The second thing that happens is that that person puts these stains on his nefesh. That if he's lucky, he does tshuva, comes Yom Kippur, he fasts, he apologizes to everybody, he prays, he does everything they need to do, and all these stains get washed off. Some of the stains, some of the sins, Yom Kippur also doesn't help. You have to go through many other things to wash these stains. If Chas Shalom a person didn't merit that, then he has to go to the washing machine up there to wash all these stains. The second, the third thing that happens when Chas Shalom a person does a avera, a sin, he creates an angel. And the Gemara calls it Malach Habala, a destructive angel, an angel that comes to annoy that person. And first of all, that angel goes up to Shamaim and prosecutes against that person and says, he created me, he said this, he did that. And that angel comes to annoy that person till that person kills him. So the person gets a ticket, and then he goes into a chas shalom, a car accident, and here he breaks this, and here he loses that, and here he loses money, and all day long, somebody is annoying him. Until that person will do tshuva, and he kills that angel. The third thing that happens is when a person, chas shalom, does the opposite will of Hashem, he creates what's called a klipa. Kabbalah calls it klipa. Klipa is like a shell, a cover. The same way that in the physical world, you will have an orange, an orange has a shell, a more like a peel. You don't eat the peel, you eat the orange. The peel covers the fruit. It's not edible, it's bitter, it's hard, it's useless. It's just covering the fruit. The same way in the spiritual level. Chaz Shalom, a person does a sin, he creates a spiritual shell, a cover around his neshama, this klipa. I call it a spiritual infection. Because the same way in the physical realm, when the person has an infection, there's one bacteria, then it becomes two, then it becomes four, then it becomes eight, it multiplies itself constantly. So the same way is this klipa. And this klipa, this shell, covers the neshama, and it dims the light of the neshama. Now it doesn't turn off the light of the neshama, because nothing can turn off the light of the neshama. But exactly if I'll take now a lamp, and I'll put over the lamp a little scarf, a shade, it will dim the light a little bit. Then I'll put like a thicker thing, I'll put like a towel, then it will, it will dim the light even more. And if I'll put a lot of towels, and I'll cover completely the lamp, I'm not going to see the light. So when a person does a lot of these sins, and it can be any sin, he covers the light of his soul with these klipot. That's why you see when a person is very not connected to Torah and mitzvot, a, they have this coldness to Torah. You come to a person who's not religious, you tell him, you want to put filin on? Eh, leave me alone. You, come, you want to come to a Torah class? There's a great rabbi now giving a class. Eh, no, I want to go watch a movie now. You see this opposition to godliness. More than that, you see this, you know, sometimes you see people who are very not religious, they despise religious people. Like as if they're like infected or something. That's because this klipa, this shell, opposes kedusha, holiness. So this is the worst thing that happens. But worse than all that, when a person chas v'shalom does an avera, he creates a spiritual blemish in all the spiritual worlds. Which to kind of explain it in a more of a clear way, imagine there's a picture in a museum in France, it's this big, that an artist 300 years ago took a bunch of paint, threw it at the canvas, went like that, and now everybody comes to marvel this picture that is worth millions and millions of dollars. People come from all over the world to look at this picture. Now imagine somebody will walk into the museum with a bucket of paint and throw it at the picture and destroy the picture completely. What will really happen? He will get arrested, then he goes to jail, then he goes to, he has to pay a fine, but in fact, what is the real problem, what he did? What was the real result that he did? He destroyed the picture. 
Nobody will ever enjoy this picture. You can't retouch it. You can't redo it. You can't copy it. That's it. He ruined it for everybody. So when I do something bad, besides that I'm doing all these things that have to do with me, I'm also affecting the entire universe. So a lot of people say, eh, mind your own business, it's my business, I'll do whatever I want. No. When I do something bad, it affects everybody around me. Even people that I don't know. And on the other hand, when I do something good, it affects everybody around me. So the thing is, that the soul comes down to this world, it goes through a very long journey, it has to prepare its, its, its journey for the world to come. And then what happens? So we know the soul can either get, go to the washing machine or it goes to Gan Eden. And in Gan Eden it sits and it waits for the time of the coming of Mashiach. It's a waiting room, but a very fancy waiting room. And the Gemara says, what are the tzaddikim are doing in Gan Eden? And it says, Yoshvim be Gan Eden, sitting in Gan Eden, ve'atrotehem berasheihen, with crowns on their, on their heads, ve'nehenim miziv ha'shchina. And they're enjoying the glory of Hashem. Hashem is shining in Gan Eden, spreading these godly revelations, this godly wisdom, and the souls enjoy, they get this pleasure from understanding it. And according to what the soul did in this world, that's how much it's going to enjoy in Gan Eden. It has a bigger capacity. If I have a big capacity, if I have a very big vessel, I can hold a lot. So one soul is sitting here, one soul is sitting here, one soul is sitting here. And it says that one soul is enjoying its level, but it looks up to the level above. The Gemara says that the soul gets burnt from seeing the light that it's above it. And I always compare it to like a fancy high-rise building. If you buy the first or the second or the third floor, it's so okay, you have a two-bedroom apartment and it's, you know, not such a great view. But you can buy the penthouse on the 40th floor with a 16-room penthouse with two indoor pools with a view to the beach. That's the best apartment in that, in that building. So Gan Eden is like a high-rise. You can be in the lower level and you don't have, to have such a good view. And you can be all the way at the top. And whatever you did in this world, that's how much you're going to enjoy in Gan Eden because you have a capacity to sustain this godly revelation. If the soul doesn't have enough capacity, it can't understand, so it's limited. And the souls are sitting in Gan Eden and waiting for the time for Mashiach to come. So we said the first world is Olam Azeh, where the souls are. Where we're here in this world when we have to do everything. The everything is based on this world. Then is Dolam HaNeshamot. So we said, Kafakela Gehenom and Gan Eden. Now comes the world of Yemot HaMashiach. And it's actually, first of it comes the, the, the world of Tchiyat HaMetim. Because once Mashiach comes, which Be'ezrat Hashem should happen any second, but in the beginning, the first 40 years, it says, The world is going to be the same. It's just going to be a perfect world. No diseases, no wars, no anger, no envy, no nothing. We're not going to need hospitals anymore. We're not going to need lawyers anymore. Everything's going to be perfect. We're just going to sit and study Torah all day long. And then we are going to have Bet HaMikdash. We're going to have sacrifices. It says that right when Mashiach comes, Moshe and Aaron are going to get resurrected because they have to explain everybody all the Kohanim what to do. But only 40 years later, there will be Tchiyat HaMetim. Tchiyat HaMetim is the resurrection of the dead. Now, it's not that the graves are going to open like a convertible and we're going to go out. Rather, we're going to get a new body. And all the Gilgulim, all the reincarnations, are all going to be sold together as one soul and in one body. And that's the time when we're going to get the reward for everything that we did here. Because here, when I did a mitzvah, my body did participated in the mitzvah but also my soul participated in the mitzvah. So the sachar, the reward of the soul, is Gan Eden. But the sachar of the body is in this world. So if my hand put filin, if my hand put charity, if my eyes looked at pure things, any organ of my body participated in the mitzvah, it needs to get a reward. Ad kamalachzor. No, just the last one. Just the last one. 
both the soul and the body participate in the mitzvot. You can't do a mitzvah just with your soul. You have to do a mitzvah with your body too. So each organ that participates in the mitzvah has to get a reward for that. If my hand put on tefillin or put tzedakah or anything, I shake the lulav, I nail the, uh, a nail into the sukkah, any physical mitzvah that I did, a woman uh, kneading the dough, the body is participating in the mitzvah, so the body also needs to get a sachar, needs to get a reward. And this is the time of, of Tchiyat HaMetim, that we have bodies, and we're going to be in this world, but here already we're going to be in such a high level of godliness that we're going to be able to see God in bodies. Now we can't see it, the Neshama can maybe un understand and comprehend, but at that time the body will be able to see it. After that comes the time of Yemot HaMashiach, so we know that in the year, till the year 6000, then we'll have the time of Tchiyat HaMetim. But in the year 6000, now, right now in 5,775, so in 225 years, we're reaching the end of 6000. Then we go to Yemot HaMashiach, which is a thousand years, a millennium, Yom Shekulotov. Same way that we have six days in creation, each day corresponds to one millennium. Once all six days are end, then we reach Shabbat. So one, once all the 6,000 years end, then we reach the Shabbat. But this Shabbat is going to be a thousand years. A thousand years of Shabbat. But not the Shabbat that, we're going to have, that we know of now. Rather, it's going to be the real Shabbat that was already planned, was, what was supposed to be given to Adam and Chava in Gan Eden. After that, then lights out and we're going to Olam Abba. The Olam Abba, the world to come, the famous world to come that we all hear about.